Welcome back to the second episode of the Dragonbone Quantum, the electronic dice roller that uses the quantum vacuum to seed its random number generator. In this episode, we'll take a look at the schematics, we'll go over the PCB layout, and finally we'll head to the bench and I'll show you how to install some surface mount components. Stay tuned. All right, so let's take a look at the schematic. We will start with the power source. The power source is a nine volt battery. Uh, that nine volt actually feeds into a diode. The diode is there for reverse uh, polarity protection. We've got an on off switch, which goes into a low dropout, an LDO based uh, voltage regulator that outputs five volts. There are some caps on there for some uh, noise protection, noise cancellation, if you will. Um, <clears throat> the 5 volts is fed into an ESP8266 D1 Mini. That device, that microcontroller, actually has its own voltage regulator on it because it's a 3.3 volt device. So the D1 Mini, being our microcontroller, microcontroller, contains all of our software. That software then drives the uh, voltage shifter here. We have a voltage translator that takes place between the 3.3 volt logic and the 5 volt logic. That then the 5 volt logic then goes out to the 74 LS 595s, which are serial to parallel shift registers. So that then feeds the LEDs. Remember on the device, the LEDs, we've got the number 1 through 9 and then 10, 20, 30, all the way to 100 in those uh, increments of 10. So let's say that the person pushes the button, they've selected a 100-sided dice, they press the button, and 53 is the number. So the software needs to figure out how to display 53 using the LEDs as they're laid out. So it would actually light up the 50 and it would light up number three. Combined together that you look at it, it's 53, two LEDs. So there's some math inside the microcontroller that we'll look at next time to figure out which bits to send out so that that can take place. Now, when you send out those bits to the 595s, the serial to parallel shift registers, when you overflow one of them, because they're tied together serially, you send the next bit to the to the next chip. So as you're pumping out these bits, I think there's, yes, there are 19 LEDs. So 19 bits can be sent out. So it's eight, eight, which is 16, and then you've got three basically, which are down here. And you can see that there's three. That's the QA, QB, and QC going out to, to D80, D90, and D100. So I labeled these the same as the number that they represent to make it easier to understand. So that's pretty much all there is. We also have a status LED over here, which is used to indicate different statuses um, in the device. Really what it's used for is to tell it when it goes into a low power mode, you know, obviously when it's on, um, that kind of stuff. So with it, with that, I mean, that's really all there is to the circuit. It's not really that complicated. Let's go and take a look at the um, PCB. So the PCB, here it is. The PCB, I actually used an auto router on. It wasn't really that complicated. I wanted to make it obviously narrow to fit into the case. So there's all these other things that are going on while you're trying to design this. You have form, fit, and function. And when it comes down to form, fit, and function, you you have to take all of those into account as you do any kind of design. So the best way to really look at this is to, let's go into the 3D view. So the 3D view, here we go. This is pretty much exactly what I had JLC PCB create for me. And the Gerber files are available for you to download and have a PCB made, or you can also breadboard it. It's not a complicated circuit. Um, particularly, you'll notice that <clears throat> the everything is surface mount except really the LEDs. Um, the resistors here, they're on the front. 
The LEDs go on the front. We have the LDO. Oh, sorry about that. I'm trying to. The LDO and the voltage translator are on top. They're pretty flat. Why is that important? Well, as the LEDs go into the top case, you're wanting to make sure that, you know, you can see the LEDs. It's kind of nice to have some of that LED. They're five millimeter, five millimeter LEDs, and they need to go up through those holes. Um, a lot of other things actually go on the bottom of it. That's because of we we have a limited height. We have a height restriction on the top. So if you look, the 74 LS 595s are actually on the back. There's a interface or a, there's some sockets so you can um, put in the D1 Mini that actually goes on the bottom. And that's designed in such a way that when you open up the battery case you can actually access the d1 minis usb so you can reprogram it you can change it you can add things to this uh, in terms of functionality there's all sorts of neat things you can do in fact let's just quickly talk about that so a couple things that i would recommend that can be done um, from a schematic standpoint not from a software standpoint yet we'll talk about that next time but I would think going with a lipo based rechargeable solution would be kind of nice i can see somebody trying to implement that um i also thought it would be kind of cool to add a small led uh screen to it lcd led screen um to it so that way maybe on the front or even on the back side of it you know you could have additional information like the wi-fi status the um, number of quantum uh, keys uh, or quantum numbers in the cache. Things like that. There's, there's all sorts of cool things you could do with the design. All right. Well, we're going to head over to the bench because I want to show you how to install some of these components. It can be kind of tricky if you've never done it before. If you've never installed surface mount. All right, so what we're going to do is put some of the parts on. You always want to put the lowest parts on first. In this case, we're going to go ahead and uh, install a couple of the resistors on a clean board. So resistors are super small. These are the beasts. I think those are 0805s. <clears throat> so the way that you want to do this is you want to do one side at a time. See if I can zoom in and it looks like we'll do this one here. This R4 looks pretty much centered. So the way that I do this is I take one side, one pad, I heat one pad up, put solder on it. I take the resistor. In this case, it doesn't matter uh, if it's front or backwards. It doesn't matter. There's not a polarity for them. However, I like to be able to check them sometimes, so I like to have the numbers on the top. And what you want to do is hold it in place with your tweezers, heat the one side that you've done, and let it cool. Now you can go and heat the other side, and it won't tombstone. Tombstoning is when basically you're trying to solder the part and it rides up on you and stands up. Now, let's put on the LDO. The, the caps will be the exact same way as the resistors. So this is the LDO voltage, voltage regulator. I suggest you do the back first. And what you want to do is hold it. I'm going to turn this just a little bit so that I can more easily control this. I'm going to heat it up, slide it in, make sure that everything is lined up on the pads, and there you go. So now you come in, touch your soldering iron to the pad or to the leg. Let it set for just a second while it heats up. And you can add your solder. That's all there is to it. So let's go ahead and put a little bit of solder on pin one of the voltage translator. 
And this one's definitely tricky to get installed. There's a couple things you want to note. Got to be careful holding this part too. Um, <clears throat> if I flash it in the light, you will see a small circle. Yep. There it is right there. And that represents pin one. It's right over here actually. It's right there. So you need to make sure that you put that at pin one. So in this scenario, it would go in like this. Now you also need to make sure that each of the legs is in the correct position. I have found that if you can hold on to the chip and kind of slide it in place, that it's one of the easier ways to get that first pin in there. There we go. Just make sure that all the other ones look like they're in place. They do. Then I'm going to go ahead and solder the back corner leg opposite of where I was. You saw it move there. Let me make sure it's still. Okay. Now, let me look at this real quick. Yeah, actually it's not bad. So... The way that you solder this is either you are going to go under a microscope and solder it, which we're not going to do, or you're just basically basically going to just flood fill it. And then we're going to use some solder wick and clean it off. So what I mean by that is exactly the way it sounds. We're going to put some solder, and we're just going to kind of flood fill it, just like that. It's creating a giant bridge. It will never work this way. That's because we have to clean it off. But... Now, what we'll do, and I actually use a different iron for this that has a different tip on it. It's got a chisel tip. You can kind of see there, it's got a chisel tip. And it's also just slightly hotter, about 30 degrees Celsius hotter than the other one. I lay it on here. So with yours, if you can't do this, you can just increase the temperature if you, if you can. And see, what you're doing is you're just basically sucking it off. Not all of it. You don't want the part to come off. But we're sucking off the solder. We're removing the solder wick. I think there's a little bit left there. Okay. Okay. So I actually think a couple of these are still... Yeah, I can tell now. So then you're going to need to go in and clean them up as best you can. And this is where you're going to need to... Use your magnifying glass or whatever you've got. I actually have some magnifiers that I wear. Now, I don't want to get my head in the shot. I'll try to keep my head out of the shot. I don't know that I can't though. All right, that's cleaned up, and then there was the other side. So I'm not gonna lie, that's a tricky one. Yep, that's it, it's fixed. Now, all of this solder flux, I basically, when it's, when it's cool, I'll spray it down with some isopropyl alcohol, and then I'll use like a toothbrush to kind of clean some of it up. It does a pretty good job. Use something. I use these chem wipes. Wipe it down. It gets a little bit cleaner. Looks a little bit more professional. There we go. Alright, so that's how you do that one. The ones on the back will actually be easier. The 74, 595s, because they're actually slightly larger. 
So let's flip over and actually do one of those. So this is the 595 and it has the exact same small round circle marking pin one right there. So pin one and pin one on the board. And this is actually a bigger chip. That's why I actually had to go on the, on the back. Put my glasses back on. And this one you do not have to flood fill that way. I was able to solder them without flood filling them. There we go. And you get one corner and then you get the other one. And if you do this right, Go kind of slow, heat each of them up. You can actually see how I'm soldering them. And yes, you can create a bridge, so you got to check them. And of course, when you go to power it up, you also, you know, might find out, hey, like on the previous one, where we removed some of the solder, we might find that we removed too much solder. But this you can see actually sucks it right up inside and that's all there is to that so that looks pretty good and you can clean that one too so the next ones we're going to do are let's do the um we only have a couple more here to go. The button is pretty easy. It's big, doesn't take much to deal with. Same kind of trick. You can probably just use your fingers. Heating it up, laying it on the pads, trying to make sure that it's centered. And then all you're going to do is do the opposite back corner to kind of lock it in place. And then you can do the other ones. Okay, then we've got the on-off switch. You've got to remember the on-off switch goes on the bottom of it so that it, when it sets into the case, so that it, when it sets into the case, it sets in correctly. It goes on the bottom. And all you got to do is just make sure that you're able to push it down. Kind of a keep pressure on it on the board with your hand or your finger like I'm doing with some of my fingers and then you can solder it in place. Let me uh, move it so you can see it better. That's it. Now the LEDs probably will be one of the last things. I'll go ahead and add one here. Let's put 100 in. So we find 100 right up here. And okay, so the trick with diodes is they have an anode and a cathode, which means they have a positive and a negative side, if you will. And if you look at the drawing here, you'll see there's a flat side. So the flat side is actually the cathode. So what you want to do is the flat side also normally has um, the short wire to it. There's a short, let's see here, let's see if I can make you see these. There's a short and a long. The short is the cathode. The long one is the anode. And if you look here also, you might be able to see a flat side. Let me see if I can get that for you. So that there's a flat side to this. Right here is the flat side. This is flat and this is rounded. And that's why the short one's there. So you're going to match up the flat side to the flat side. That's really all you have to do. That's how it goes in. 
turn it over. Again, this is why you're doing height installations so that you can just use natural gravity like this is being held in place. I'll put my finger down, kind of hold the board, keep a little pressure on it. I also, I always only do one side, then I come up and check because if for some reason there's any distance between the bottom of the LED, if there's any distance between the bottom of the LED, uh, then I can go ahead and just heat one side and push on it. If you've soldered both sides, it's going to be really difficult. Okay, put the soldering iron on. Heat it up. Let me do one more for you. I'm not sure that I'm getting all this in the frame. Okay, so what we want to do is let's do a 90 here. So we find the flat side, which is the cathode. Slide it in there, flat to flat. I can see that, flat to flat. Roll it over. Now I'm going to put a little finger pressure onto it. You can see it wobbling there. I want it straight. I'm going to put some solder on it. Then I'm going to look at it to make sure that I actually got it straight and it's pushed all the way in. In this case it is. And then I can solder the other side. Oh, look at that. I created a bridge. Let me show you that. So, to get rid of this bridge, it's easy. All you do is clean off the tip of your soldering iron, and you come in and drag it between the two of them. That's all there is to it. Cut it off. Okay, then there's one more item that I want to share with you. <clears throat> okay, so installing the 9-volt battery holder, snap-on connector, you're going to actually install it from underneath. So on the top, you can see it says nine volts, ground, and uh, BT1, which is just battery one. So you wanna take the black wire and from underneath go into the ground position. And then from the top, you're gonna to solder it. And then you can go ahead and do the same thing with the positive side. And solder that. And that's it. Now, one recommendation I make is that you should go ahead and use some hot glue to kind of lock that in place like I did here. This is hot glue in place to keep it from um, accidentally getting pulled out. Uh, as you can see, this is where the D1 Mini goes. Um, this is my completed board. Anyway, it's not really hard. Yeah, it's not that big of a deal in installing the diode. I think yours is actually going to go on top. Maybe not, maybe underneath. With that, I hope that you go off and make one yourself and uh, enjoy. All right, learn something new every day, and stay tuned for the last episode. We'll go over the software. All right, take it easy. All right, so let's take a look at the You guys have no idea how many takes that I have to do to make these videos.